So hi, I'd like to welcome uh, John Harold, who's going to be our presenter today, talking about process-oriented approaches to altered and extreme states of consciousness. Um, John has a lot of background to be talking about this. Um, first, he's had his own experiences of uh, altered and extreme states. Second, he's um, got a, has a degree in process-oriented approaches. And uh, third, he has a lot of experiences as a hearing voice facilitator, um, which is, I think it's a really important movement, the hearing voices movement, and he works in the Puget Sound area in Washington. So without further ado, John, I'll let you um, give your talk. <laughs> great, great. Thank you so much, everyone. This is uh, really, really exciting to talk about process work and process-oriented approaches to altered and extreme states. Um, I uh, This is actually a really special day. This is the anniversary, uh, the six-year anniversary of the day that my dog Charlotte died. And it was her death that really began uh, this experience for me that resulted in an extreme state. So uh, there's something very special about this day. It's a really special anniversary for me. Um, I've been thinking about extreme states pretty much constantly for about six years since having my own experience. Uh, this really, really rocked my world. And uh, my thinking around this subject has changed a great deal. I've had a lot of wonderful teachers and uh, wonderful experiencers who have taught me a great deal. And I'm really excited to share with you. Um, I am. Uh, I'd say that it, there's some, some part of me that's tempted to pathologize myself and say that maybe I have a character flaw for uh, having so many slides. I have a lot of material. I almost always have more material than I really have time for. But instead of pathologizing myself, um, how about I'll just say that I'm really excited. I'm very excited and I have a lot of material and I want to share it with you. So it's really not uh, necessarily a flaw to have so much material. It's, maybe it's a good thing. Um, I have many people to thank. Uh, I really want to just name out uh, Arnold and Amy Mandel, who are the uh, really considered like the founders of process work. Um, but there's a whole other cast of characters who have been working on process-oriented thinking for about 40 years now. And this is just a small list of uh, people who have been my direct teachers in process work. And I'm very thankful uh, to them for the learning that they've imparted on me. And I also want to thank ISPS for making this possible and inviting me to do this webinar. What a, what a great opportunity. Thank you. All right, I want to give a shout out uh, to anyone who's listening uh, right now or listening to the recording. I want to uh, give a big shout out uh, to anyone whose behavior and language doesn't really make sense to those around them. And I want to uh, shout out to anyone who's experiencing a reality that's different from the one that the majority of us think is real. And uh, a big fist bump to anyone who's been told that they shouldn't trust themselves, that they're mentally ill, quote unquote. I always use quotes around the phrase mental illness, uh, but that they're mentally ill for having such experiences. And a big shout out to anyone who's looking for better thinking, better ideas than this thing that we're calling mental illness. So who am I? I'm going to just tell you a very brief story about how I came into process work and uh, a little bit about my uh, experience with an extreme state. I have um, told this story in greater detail and I have some videos on YouTube. So I'm going to uh, go through this fairly quickly so that we can really get into the meat of this uh, webinar, which is process work. Okay, so uh, close to six years ago now, uh, I went into an extreme state. I, I, it was like this rocket heading off into the night. I wound up with a great deal of energy that I did, never had before, and I wound up skipping sleep for like five days, and I sort of took off like a rocket, and I wound up with all of this energy that I never had before, and it was pretty disturbing to those around me. Um, but there were many aspects of the experience um, that I want to maybe share with you here. Okay, so in December of 2012, I was really like not myself. I was acting in very, very strange ways. I had not slept for five whole days. And uh, I had this very pressured, like fast speech. I was just talking to everybody really, really quick. And my words didn't really make sense to everybody. They made sense to some people, but most people, they didn't really understand what I was trying to uh, communicate. And uh, again, you know, behaving in a way that I normally not. Usually I'm a little bit more of a reserved person. And in this, in this case, I was in everyone's face. I just had all the confidence in the world. And uh, I was starting to, you know, really agitate other people. During this state, I had very unusual beliefs. And uh, some of those beliefs were, and I really did, I believed that I had made a trillion dollars. And I believed that I had uh, won a Nobel Prize. I uh, believed that I had cured cancer. And I believed that I was the next Dalai Lama. These sound like unusual and strange beliefs, but I really did believe them when I went into this unusual state of mind. I got to a point where I was starting to see formulas and patterns in everything and started to see formulas in comedy and had become convinced that I had found like the mathematical formula to all comedies. So you can imagine, you can see here that my beliefs were getting very, very unusual. Was it disturbing? 
Yes, it was. It was absolutely disturbing to a lot of the people around me. Okay. But there was more to this experience than just being disturbing. Okay. It was disturbing to those around me, but inside it was really magical and sacred. Uh, this was, um, this is an experience of beauty and unity that I had never uh, experienced before. I felt connected to everything. Um, and that was the time where I started to hear bells. Uh, I hear bells in my left and right ears that tell me yes and no. And these are bells that I hear, but people around me don't hear them. And so this was really kind of the onset of the bells. I had moments in this really uh, out of control state where when I was alone, I could stare at candle flames and actually bend them like with my mind, with my intent. And you can imagine that that probably didn't calm me down to have that happen. It actually only made me more excited to have all this magic enter my life. Um, and this is also the beginning of uh, frequent numerical synchronicity. I have kind of a strange relationship with numbers where they just seem to line up in these really amazing ways. And it's not something that I'm trying to do. The numbers kind of come at me. They speak to me. Um, and that was like waking up from the dream. You know, that's what it felt like. It felt like, well, if life is a dream, then this unusual state of mind is like waking up from the dream. And I was very excited. I wanted to bring all my friends along. And so, of course, I called all of them at like three and four in the morning. And uh, that definitely like you know, roused a lot of people's suspicion. So in this state with all this energy and all these unusual beliefs, I did find my way to the hospital. And when I was at the hospital, I, I got the prevailing view. OK, and the prevailing view was, John, you got to calm down. OK, you are having a manic episode. Uh, you're, you're experiencing psychosis. This is extremely disturbing and we need these problems to like go away now. Okay, and uh, I was told that I was bipolar, that I had bipolar disorder and, and that that's a serious and persistent mental illness. And all those beliefs that I had uh, about the Dalai Lama and the Nobel Prize, I was told that those are uh, delusions. Um, which felt like a really steep drop to me because I really did feel those inside in the most genuine way. And after I got out of the hospital, I was very, very angry for really a couple of years. And uh, when I was experiencing so much of that anger, I was told again and again by multiple people, whoa there, you're too angry, John. Okay, so uh, my, anger, my, my feelings had been pathologized. And I like this image of the fire extinguisher putting the fire out. I needed to put my fire out. So uh, that began a very, very difficult year. Uh, 2013 was a really tough time for me. I took a number of different psych drugs. I did a number of very fast withdrawals. I, um, you know, I behaved in scary ways. It's not like coming out of the hospital, I, I was better, you know, in a way coming out of the hospital, I was still in an altered state and I was altered from taking drugs and I was altered from being told that I was sick. So that was a very difficult time of feeling very lost. Now, in the beginning of 2014, I, uh, I saw somebody named Gary Reese, and he's a process worker. And I, I told him about my story. I told him about the bells and the candle flames and the Dalai Lama and the cancer cure. And his response was, wow, you have a lot of creative energy. That, that's an amazing experience. You know, I think the magic that you experienced was actually real. And I'm curious, John, you know, do you want to ride this horse? Uh, do you want to make meaning out of this experience and maybe share that meaning with the world? And I remember when he said that to me, I, I was on the phone with him and I just looked at the phone. And I thought, I'll be right there. You know, like his attitude of welcoming what I had been through was, was something that I really needed at the time. And, you know, he wasn't polarized against psychiatric drugs or, or psychiatry. Uh, he said psychiatric drugs are fine and maybe there will come a time where you don't need to take them. And I really appreciated that openness that he had. And this is one of the biggest things that he said to me, because I, I, in our early work together, I said, man, I am so angry. And he said, hmm, how high do those flames go? How, how angry are you? And I said, oh, they go about here. They're pretty, they're pretty high. And he said, higher. What would it be like if the flames actually went higher? What if you got more angry? What would, what would happen next? I encourage you to become more angry. So that was like, you know, I had, I had seen the prevailing view, which said that I need to put my fire out. And uh, this guy actually was like pouring gas onto my fire. And uh, that was different for me. Well, I got hooked uh, by that. I, that. For me, that attitude of uh, acknowledging the, the, the reality of my experience, that's just what I needed. And so I started seeing him, and I still see Gary today uh, as my therapist. Uh, a little over a year after our work together, I enrolled in, uh, in the school at the Process Work Institute and enrolled in a master's program, which I finished about a year ago. So I've really been swimming in the process work world, and uh, the ideas of process work just keep getting more and more fascinating as I get to know them better. So, you know, for the last six years, I've sort of been flowing down this river. Uh, and uh, I like to illustrate this because, you know, I had this really meaningful experience. 
that was really sacred to me. And then, you know, I, I landed in the mental hospital, which was kind of like this big steep drop uh, to go from having this meaningful experience to being told that I was mentally ill. But over time, you know, I started thinking about the bells and the numbers that I see. And I, I recognize that there's something about this experience that was very, very spiritual. It brought some amazing, lovely things into my life. So, you know, I went from meaningful experience to mental illness. Then I started to think, well, maybe it's a spiritual emergence. You know, there's some, I can't ignore uh, the beauty in my life uh, that's there. And then I started studying process work. And in process work, they call these altered and extreme states of consciousness. And I've always really liked that vocabulary. There's a level of nuance there that I really appreciate. Uh, but, you know, the river keeps moving, and so do I. And in a way, I'm kind of right back to where I started. I had a meaningful experience. And, you know, who knows how I'm going to frame this experience next year. You know, if you ask me next year, I might say, yeah, you know, I had this really meaningful experience, and there are parts of it that were kind of crazy, admittedly, but there were parts of it that were really, really meaningful and meant so much to me. And the reason I put this river here is that I want to encourage you to flow down your own river, too. Uh, that we don't have to get stuck in diagnostic vocabulary and that I want to encourage you to exercise the freedom that you have to frame your experiences in the terms that make best sense to you and just to keep flowing and follow yourself. Okay, so here's one of my very favorite, it's actually one of my least favorite words, but I want to make sure that we, we name this word uh, pathologize. It should be a four letter word, uh, but it has more letters. And you know, the word pathologize means to view or treat something or someone as abnormal or unhealthy as a disease or a disorder. And you know, the difference between having a meaningful experience and being diagnosed with mental illness is pathologizing. It's the pathologizing that comes in and says, no, that's not a sacred experience. You're sick, you're ill, you know, we need to fix you. Uh, so I'm gonna, I wanna make sure that we cover that word uh, because one of my greatest passions in life is to spread non-pathologizing ideas about this thing we're calling mental illness. And, you know, for me, the, one of the very first moves to make when it comes to being non-pathologizing is to eliminate that phrase mental illness, because, uh, you know, that phrase, it, just even saying that it's ill, I mean, that's pathologizing kind of in the most direct way I can imagine. I'm interested in talking a lot about reality. I, um, I like to promote a deeper and virtual understanding of reality. Uh, the virtual piece is not something we're gonna get into in this talk, but I have spoken about it in the past, but we are gonna talk about reality and get a little deeper into it. Uh, I uh, have a lot of involvement with the Hearing Voices Network. That's played a huge role in my life. I host a non-judgmental space for experiencers to be able to share uh, what they've been through, and that's in, in this group called Puget Sound Hearing Voices. And I'm also interested in encouraging other people to find their fire. Whatever that fire is, it can be different than my fire. And then spread it. Uh, spread your fire. This is a flyer uh, for the group that I facilitate, Puget Sound Hearing Voices. Uh, we host uh, weekly meetings every Tuesday night, and they last for an hour and a half. And we're in our fourth year now of doing so. And, you know, the Hearing Voices Network is very easy to explain. Uh, this is a group where we, uh, we hold a safe and non-judgmental space for people to come share their experiences, whatever frame they happen to uh, view them in. So we can have people come in who say, you know, I'm hearing voices because I have schizophrenia. I'm, I have mental illness that needs to go away. And then across the table, we might have somebody who also hears voices but views it in a spiritual frame. And there might be somebody else there who hears voices and maybe they view it in like a nutritional frame. And by the way, the phrase hearing voices is an umbrella term that actually covers unusual sensory experiences, including extreme states. So, um, you know, people who have had altered and extreme states and maybe don't hear voices, uh, that actually still falls under the umbrella of the Hearing Voices Network. But this group has been a huge, huge part of, of, of my life. Um, both I, I lean on it for personal support, and then I also really enjoy providing that space uh, for people to be able to support each other, too. Okay, so let's get into some vocabulary here, because one of my favorite parts about process work is the vocabulary. Um, and instead of mental illness, again, a phrase that I really don't like because it's so pathologizing, uh, let's talk about altered states of consciousness. I like this image here of the train tracks, because, you know, that train track that's heading straight, that's like sort of a normal state of being. And then there's that track that kind of moves a little off to the side, and that's what I think of as an altered state, because an altered state is a state of awareness that's outside the usual way, of experiencing, perceiving, and expressing. Uh, you know, an example of an altered state is falling in love. That's sort of a different way of being, but we don't really get pathologized for falling in love. In fact, we often get celebrated for falling in love, but falling in love is not usually a state that gets us diagnosed as psychotic. 
okay, even though it is a little different than the normal way. Now, uh, falling in love may not be called psychotic, but extreme states of consciousness, that's generally where people do get called psychotic. And uh, just for this definition, we'll just define an extreme state of consciousness as, as one that is very far outside normal. And, you know, the phrase normal is really just variant and dependent on the, on the particular culture. There are cultures where if you don't hear voices, there's something wrong with you. Okay, so uh, it, it really depends. Um, and I, I just put that little asterisk there. Uh, there's more to come here. Okay, we're starting out with very simple definitions, and we're going to get a little more complex as we go on. So, you know, the familiar message, like, you know, I'm telling you, I'm flowing down that river from the meaningful experience to mental illness. The familiar message is that altered and extreme states are, are garbage, right? They're junk, and they need to go away. That's why we call them mental illness. And um, there's nothing meaningful in having unusual beliefs. Those are delusions. You've departed from reality, you're out of touch with reality, and that experience needs to go. It's that kind of attitude that caused me to have to flow down from having a meaningful experience to mental illness. So the pathologizing philosophies are all around us. Altered and extreme states are kind of like a hot potato, okay, in that when when we get altered, uh, sometimes it's like the hot potato and we want to just, ah, I don't want to take it, you know, you, you take it. And so sometimes we experience being altered, but then we don't really let it sit with us. We pass it off onto somebody else. And so, you know, altered and extreme states are deeply marginalized um, by ourselves when, when we go into them. And they're also marginalized by other people. The reason why I put the city, the, the potato there is that this is an example of something called the city shadow. Okay, this is a concept in process work. And the idea there is that the altered states are something that we don't really hold. Okay, we pass them off onto other people. Well, those altered states are going to land somewhere. And they end up landing on the more sensitive of us. Okay, uh, people who can hold the pain of other people. And so uh, it's not that altered states really belong to that group of people, it's that altered states have landed on that group of people because the mainstream, the people who are living in the city, won't acknowledge their own madness, and uh, that's why it has to land on certain people. So I, I would encourage people to hold the hot potato a little longer and to maybe not give it up quite so fast. I like this image here of a pit maneuver. It's where a car is running another car off the road. And I often think of the pit maneuver when I imagine uh, altered and extreme states because, uh, you know, the phrase mental illness is like running people off the road. It's like saying, hey, this is not a meaningful experience. That needs to go away. And, you know, most of us fear unusual states. Even I fear unusual states in myself and in other people. I can feel that hesitation. And, uh, you know, the earliest evidence that we fear unusual states comes when we're children. Okay, like when I was a child, I remember being called weird, crazy, nuts. Uh, by people because maybe I was a little uh, different uh, than most of my classmates. And, uh, you know, the very strongest evidence of this marginalization of these states is the concept of mental illness. Uh, I just, I don't even know uh, where to start uh, with my complaints about that phrase because the pathologizing is actually in the vocabulary and it denies us meaning uh, from these experiences. And, you know, there's nothing objectively sick about unusual states. I think we call them sick because we're so uncomfortable with them. And I personally found the notion of mental illness to be uh, really overpowering. Uh, I didn't really feel like I had any agency when being viewed as mentally ill. And, you know, the, phrase, the concept of mental illness, it polarized me against myself, okay? Because, you know, this unusual state came from within me, and to view it as mentally ill, it actually caused me to sort of go at war, uh, go to war against myself, and that, that wasn't terribly helpful. And, you know, not every culture or context views unusual states of mind as mental illness, okay? There are times uh, where maybe this is viewed as a healthy thing and not something that needs to go away. My very, my very favorite... Um, concept of the contextual nature of uh, extreme states and mental illness is Beatlemania. You guys remember Beatlemania, uh, where the Beatles would come to town in the 60s, and then these people would just lose control of themselves. They were so excited about the Fab Four. And, you know, the behaviors that these people uh, exhibit uh, in the presence of the Beatles, that does appear to be mental illness to me. I mean, like, if you took the energy that these people have in the presence of the Beatles, and if you just took them out from that situation and pluck them into like an emergency room with that same sense of elatement and excitement, I suspect that they would be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Okay, but somehow losing control of ourselves in the presence of the Beatles is it's okay. Okay. And you know, back to the contextual nature of altered states, imagine if the Beatles came to town and everyone was going really wild for them. 
and then you were not uh, aroused at all. Okay, imagine if you were just completely bored by the fact that the Beatles were in town. If that were the way that you reacted, that actually would be considered like an altered state because your lack of reaction to the Beatles is now sort of outside the usual way of being, which is all of this uh, excitement and elation, which is interesting. So it's very, um, very contextual. And it's, it's like there's some altered states that are privileged and there's some extreme states that are privileged and Beatlemania would be a good example of one. So, um, you know, instead of viewing uh, people as mentally ill or the idea that when you show symptoms uh, of a certain diagnostic label that that means we need to like flip on a switch and now declare you mentally ill for the rest of your life, uh, process work employs something that's a little bit more like a dial, a dial instead of a switch. So imagine you're kind of like a radio. You've got all these different stations and these different stations are like states of mind. So you can see here on the left, we have your everyday normal experience. And then on the right, we have death and beyond death. And then in between are all of these different uh, states of mind that we can get into. It's like a spread. And, you know, the dial, I, I like the dial up there because it shows that, like, we can get into any of these states. Uh, you know, if you get, uh, if you have an addiction, does that mean that you're sick? See, I don't, I don't think of it that way. I think addictions are states of mind that we can all get into, uh, as are extreme states, as is uh, shock and dissociation or dreams. Uh, these are as natural as breathing, as far as I'm concerned, and they're not reserved for a certain segment of people. And if you have one of these states, there's nothing implied in process work that says that you're sick for having had that experience. It just means that something you kind of got dialed into that one state. I, I really appreciate that philosophy there. Uh, because it means that altered and extreme states can belong to all of us. And uh, it's not just something that's reserved for uh, some small population of people. A very big belief in process work, I like this megaphone here, is that altered and extreme states are valuable. Okay, They're here to teach us something. They contain uh, information uh, that is really valuable and meaningful that we can all learn from. Uh, not only the people who are experiencing altered and extreme states, but especially those around them. Okay, the altered, it's, uh, altered states are here to teach our whole community something very, very important. You see how this is a pretty big departure from the concept of mental illness? Instead of looking at them as mental illness as something that needs to go away, let's look at altered states as something really valuable. You know, children are really altered. Um, and, you know, I like these pictures of these, these kids doing funny things here uh, because, you know, children are just naturally altered. It's, it's the way that they often are. And, you know, if I were going to come up with a very simple explanation for why they're so altered, it might be that they haven't yet learned what normal really is. And so they can just be themselves and just be unabashedly genuine. And, you know, some of the behaviors that kids uh, get away with, we might not be able to get away with as adults. And in fact, if we went into a hospital with some of the expressions on our faces like you see these kids, we might get diagnosed or pathologized for that, uh, but somehow when kids do it, it's, it's okay. Um, but you know, we eventually do get taught what normal is. And um, I like this image of this hotel, it's called the Walled Off Hotel. Uh, you know, that as kids, you know, we may experience um, of these unusual states of mind, but then we go to school and our cultures and families influence us and tell us how to be. And so we learn what normal is over the years. And it's not like it happens all at once. You know, they don't say, kids, this is what normal is. But if you go astray from, from what is considered normal, then you'll get these little punishments. And the punishments come in these little accusations like, you're weird, you know, you're nuts, you're a little crazy, uh, you're abnormal, uh, you're mentally ill. Uh, and, you know, when you get told these kinds of things, they're pretty painful. I remember being told that I was weird as a child, and that was a difficult thing to hear. And so, uh, you know, what happens is that because those accusations are painful, we sort of learn to kind of um, behave right, you know, uh, act in line, start being normal, uh, because being punished for not being normal can hurt. Well, in that process of um, marginalizing experiences that are sort of not normal, we actually learn to not even notice them anymore. So imagine, you know, I, I, uh, I heard bells as a child in fourth grade, uh, but I wound up pushing that experience out of my awareness. And for over 10 years, I, I stopped hearing them uh, until later. And then they kind of came back. But it, it came to a point where I was like no longer even willing to um, have these kinds of things come into my awareness. But, you know, unusual states of mind are very, very clever. You can almost view them as like a person. Um, because unusual states, if they're not going to visit us in our daily lives because we marginalize those experiences, then uh, those states are going to come into our dreams. 
uh, because dreams are like a parallel world of experience where the usual part of ourselves kind of moves out of the way and then suddenly these dreams can kind of come in and make their way into our awareness that's why dreams are so weird you know you ever have dreams where you're like I would never do that. That's totally not me. Well, that's exactly the point of dreams. It's that not me that's able to come forward and actually get into our awareness. Dreams tunnel underneath our resistance. Kind of imagine that. And they introduce us to new parts of ourselves and new ways of being. Now, how are altered states actually useful? Because again, in process work, they are viewed as gold. And, um, you know, the, the idea behind altered states is that they really uh, bring us information as to who we essentially are, uh, not only as individuals, but also as a group. And they wake us up and they wake others up to new ways of being. And sometimes that wake up is kind of a violent process. Sometimes it's not a, it's not a nice way to be woken up uh, to have somebody go into an extreme state. But the wake up does happen, uh, even if it's something that's really unpleasant. And, uh, you know, altered and extreme states contain lesser known information uh, for ourselves and for our culture. And, uh, you know, they are sometimes difficult to decipher, that's true. But they are here to teach us something, okay? Altered states tend to happen to us. And as an example of that, you know, uh, six years ago when I went into this big altered state that eventually became really extreme, you know, it's not like I asked for that to happen. I didn't order it to happen. I really didn't want that to happen, and it happened anyway, okay? So it sort of came out of the clouds and kind of hit me over the head with a hammer. And, uh, you know, I think at the time I viewed myself as just like a victim of the extreme state. You know, this just happened to me. But in process work, when things happen to us, uh, they're actually calling us, okay? There's something that's wanting to be better known. There's something that's like knocking at our door that's wanting to be included and wants to come in, which is, again is a big departure from the idea that I'm just a victim of the extreme state. But maybe there's something about the extreme state that is actually here to teach me something and I might even consider opening the door. Okay. So process work can be very, very difficult to describe. Um, when I first started this program, uh, they were very clear. They said, you know, if you think you're going to be good at this after two years, forget it. Uh, consider a 10-year plan. Uh, that you'll be really good at this after 10 years of practice. And there was something about that that kind of set me at ease a little bit. It took some of the pressure off me to feel like I need to like master this in two years, because that's just not a realistic goal. Um, but I'm going to try to explain process work in the very fastest way I can imagine. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, so you've got life as normal. Okay, I've got these pictures of the beach chairs. This is just like the life as usual. It doesn't have to be paradise like it looks like in this picture, but this is like your regular world where maybe you don't have any new problems. And then comes the disturbing energy, okay? Something comes into your life and it's, again, it's that knocking at your door saying, hey, I want to come in. And, you know, like if this kid showed up at my car, I might not be inclined to roll the window down and greet him. I think I'd be more inclined to put up a block and say, no, you know, disturbing energy, don't come into my life, stay away. And so I erect this barrier uh, between me and this disturbing energy. I don't want it in my life. It's like that hot potato. Now, if I resist that, that, that energy enough, then the energy will become more clever. And I like this image because, uh, you know, altered and extreme states, they can kind of break into our lives. Uh, and they're going to have to break into our lives with at least as much power as we've been resisting them, probably more. Okay, so the harder I resist it, the harder that energy is going to have to come in in order to get my attention, get my awareness. And I would say that uh, when it comes to things that are trying to get our attention and our awareness, uh, you know, they can use lots of tricks to get our attention. It could be a disease. It could be an accident. It could be an unwanted relationship. It could be strange coincidences. But I personally believe that one of the most clever tricks that uh, a process can do to get into our awareness is an altered or extreme state. To me, that's like the most clever move that something can take to uh, come into our awareness and get into our minds. So where do altered states come from? Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about process structure. Um, and uh, I, I was taught this in the, the very first residency of the process program, and it's, it's been one of the most valuable ideas. OK, so all of us are like mountains. Imagine that. We're all like mountains. And um, most of us are more familiar with one side of the mountain than the other. OK, so uh, you know, we, we go into that familiar part of ourselves. We know the ropes. We know the, the way through it. Uh, we know how to manage the risks in that part of the mountain. And so that's like the familiar part of ourselves, as illustrated here on the left. That's also called the primary process. It's the familiar experience. It's how we identify ourselves. 
Now, on the other side of the mountain, there's actually a whole other part of ourselves. And uh, this is a part of ourselves that we generally don't have some familiarity with. Sometimes that's a part of ourselves that we don't really like. Okay, that's maybe a little disturbing when we look at that part of ourselves. And so if you climb up the familiar part of the mountain and you get up to the very, very top, and then you look over the top into that part of yourself that you don't really know, that, that little area is called the edge. And, you know, the edge is really like the top of the mountain. You're climbing up the top of the mountain, you get to the edge, you peer over the other side, holy cow, there's a whole other side of the mountain there that I never really knew. Okay. Now, if you're in a normal state, okay, like a normal state would be that your awareness is in that familiar part of yourself. You're hanging out on the familiar side of the mountain. You're in your primary process, okay? You haven't jumped into this emerging, uh, lesser known, maybe part of yourself that's a little bit disturbing. And so an example of like a normal state or my primary process, my very primary process is that I'm a person who doesn't sing in public, okay? That's not me. Okay, uh, singing in public is not me. So like the part of me that's actually like a lounge singer, that's on the other side of the mountain. That's like, you know, I don't really identify with that part of me. Okay. Um, and, you know, if somebody asks me to sing in public, then this is sort of what I imagine in my mind. There's some figure inside me that says, don't go there. You're going to sing out of tune. You're going to embarrass yourself. Something bad is going to happen. And so I tend not to do that. But uh, sometimes I do. I mean, like, you know, buy me a beer, you know, that, that might that might be cause me to kind of be able to jump over my edge and pick up that microphone and actually start singing. So here's an illustration of like an altered state. OK, so, you know, I was in that familiar place and then I jumped over the edge and I actually picked up the microphone and I started singing. Well, singing in public for me is a little bit of an altered state. Um, I get a little trancy when I do that. And, uh, you know, if I'm singing in public, I might say, you know, I'm usually not like this, but here we go, I'm gonna do it, okay? So that's me like jumping into that lesser known part of me, the emerging part of me. Now, when I sing in public, uh, here's what happens is that I, I get really nervous and then I decide to do it and then I pick up the microphone and then I blank out and I sing, okay? But I'm not really that aware when that happens. I go somewhere else when I'm singing. And then when the song is over and I put the microphone down, suddenly I'm kind of back Okay, so I got into kind of a trancy state. I tend to get into trancy states when I sing in public. And that's actually exactly what happens when we get to our edges. Okay, when we reach the limits of what we know, and we go into an experience that's not so known, we get a little altered. Okay, that's the process work framework of how altered states come about, is that we go into that part of ourselves that's maybe not so familiar. Okay, so when it comes to edges, in my mind, I, I like to imagine uh, buildings when I think of edges. And, uh, you know, here we are looking at something that's a little bit like a Quonset hut. It's kind of a pretty graduated uh, uh, shape here. And just imagine, like, if I had to cross from one side of this building to the other and I had some ropes, I could probably climb up there. And I might be able to get myself down in a somewhat safe way. Okay, so that's not like a real steep edge. It's sort of a more graduated curve. It's not, not really steep, but more graduated. And so, you know, crossing an edge like this, which would be like singing in public for me, it's an edge, but I can, I'm capable of crossing it. When I do cross that edge, it's kind of an uncomfortable place, but the, comfort, the discomfort is something that I can work with and manage. And I end up growing when I cross that edge. It's a little bit disorienting, but like, I do have this graceful landing when I, when I, when I come over to the other side and I can sing in public. And, uh, you know, once I do sing in public, I can remember the part of me that generally doesn't want to sing in public, and I can actually go back to that part. Okay, so it's sort of a graceful, uh, it's like a graceful uh, crossing of an edge. Okay, now imagine a very steep edge. Okay, so this is the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. Uh, imagine that you have an obstacle in yourself that's really, really steep. OK, um, like, for example, like, you know, before 2012, if you had asked me that if I'm a mystical person, I would have said, absolutely not. No way. That's not me. And if you bought me a beer, that would not cause me to become a mystical person. OK, that's a much steeper edge than that. And so, you know, to cross an edge like that, for me, I had to develop a lot of energy to get up to the top of that edge. And then, you know, it's a lot of resistance to actually cross that place. And then, you know, if I do cross an edge like that, OK, imagine, I mean, I'm going to fall now. Now I'm falling down. Uh, and when I land after crossing a really, really steep edge, it's sort of like a disorienting experience. 
Okay, so, you know, just metaphorically imagine falling from a great height and hitting the ground really hard. It's like a really loud thud, okay? Well, when you cross a really steep edge, sometimes when you land on the other side of that edge, it's a very, very disorienting experience, okay? It's a, it's a thud when you land onto the other side. And you might land on the other side in such a way that it's like so disorienting that I don't even remember what it was like to be on the other side of that edge. Can you kind of imagine what that might look like? Crossing an edge that's so steep that it's really disorienting to go there? Well, this is where we get into one of the more advanced ideas in process work, which is uh, one of the frameworks for what extreme states are, okay? And that extreme states can be viewed as like a process inversion, okay? And what I, what I mean by that is that suddenly now, you know, we have those emerging and familiar parts of ourselves. What if those two parts actually change positions, okay? And now that I am, um, the familiar John is like, off, you know, he like headed off into the night, he's gone. And now all I'm left with is that secondary part of myself, that other part that I don't normally know. Now, a way to illustrate that would be the here we are back to the process mountain. And uh, remember that, you know, usually it's the familiar part of ourselves that lives here on the left hand side of the mountain. Well, this time, all I'm left with is that emerging part of myself. That's all I identify with is the part of me that I usually don't really know or don't really like. And that familiar John, the one who's like well-spoken and kind of reserved and polite, he's gone, okay? And all that's left is this John that's really in everyone's face, very forward, talking really fast, and has all this energy. Well, you know, if you, if you experience a process inversion, uh, there might be language like John needs help. You know, John isn't himself. Maybe John's mentally ill. And it's not that John's mentally ill. It's that John's uh, processes have been inverted. Okay, can you kind of imagine that? And I put this image here of uh, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz because, you know, when our processes invert, we're not in Kansas anymore. Okay? We are, we're in a new environment. We're in a new place that's very, very different uh, from what we were familiar with. And that's what it was like for me, by the way, going into this place. Because, you know, normally I don't believe that I'm the next Dalai Lama. <laughs> but I somehow went over this really steep edge that, and I landed over that steep edge with such disorientation that I actually believed that I was going to be the next Dalai Lama. It kind of speaks to uh, how, how well this model can work. Well, uh, you know, since having this experience, I, uh, you know, I can say for sure that when I got home from the hospital, I felt very sad that I was taken from that place. Okay, the, the, altered, the altered place felt more real to me than regular life. And I remember feeling a great deal of grief that I was no longer there, and I desperately wanted to return back to that magical state. Uh, well, I've been building tunnels in my mountain uh, for the last several years. And what I, what I mean by tunnels is that I'm really trying to make it possible for some of that magic that entered my life to like come into my daily experience so that I don't have to cross the Transamerica Pyramid every time I want to have a mystical experience. I'm trying to tunnel under so that I can have a little bit of mysticism in my daily life. Okay, get real. <laughs> Let's talk about reality. This is one of my very, very favorite uh, topics because, you know, if you've been diagnosed as uh, psychotic or mentally ill, there's a voice in the background, sometimes it's right in the foreground, that says, you're out of touch with reality. You're not in reality, you're having an unreal experience, or you're hearing voices because I don't hear those voices, your voices mustn't be real. And I have a big problem with that. I personally think that one of the very most dangerous ideas in all of the mental health world is the idea that there's really only one reality, okay? And that the, the only reality that really matters is the one that we can all agree is happening in the moment, okay? I, I think that's like a mousetrap, that's a big problem. And uh, the an antidote to this problem is the ice cream cone model of reality. Again, one of my very favorite concepts in process work. Uh, and the reason I like the ice cream cone is that it accommodates all experiences of reality, whether or not those experiences are actually shared with other people. And uh, this model of reality, I like to talk about it a lot. It has three components, uh, consensus reality, dreamland, and essence. And we're going to get into these three uh, different levels of, of reality here. So the first level of reality is consensus reality. And the, the reason we, we talk about the ice cream cone is that, you know, when you get an ice cream cone, there's actually ice cream like sticking out of the top of the cone. So that's the ice cream that you can observe, you can see it, you can taste it. And so that stands for the reality that we can agree is actually happening in the moment. And so this is a part of reality that's like anything that can be measured, okay? It's the observable material world. It's the world of physical form. Uh, and again, you know, it's commonly assumed that this is all of reality. Okay, because remember, you know, I had this experience of believing that I was the Dalai Lama, 
am I the Dalai Lama? Like, clearly not. And so because I'm not the Dalai Lama in consensus reality, it was considered uh, that I am out of touch with reality because I believe that I'm the next Dalai Lama. Well, look, this, this ice cream cone actually can make room for having experiences that aren't shared. Now, in, in consensus reality, uh, consensus reality is dualistic. And what I mean by dualistic is I am not you. Okay? Like, we are separate from each other in space. And you're not going to hear language like that. I am you. Okay? I am not you. You and I are separate people. That's just a natural fact of consensus reality. Now, as we fall down the cone, okay, if we, if we drift down the cone a little bit, we get into the part of the cone where there is ice cream there, but we can't really see it or taste it yet because it's kind of trapped inside the cone. And so that stands for like the reality that we can't necessarily observe and see and agree is happening. Uh, and that's like anything that's present, but it isn't really being mentioned. Can you imagine that? Uh, it's where your emotions live. It's where your dreams live. It's where a lot of your like subjective experience lives. Uh, things that are happening in your body. You might have something happening in your body that's different from those around you. That's like a dreamland experience because it's not something we can all share and acknowledge is happening to all of us at the same time. Uh, that's a very important part of reality. Now, we're going to drift down to the very bottom of the cone. This is my favorite part of reality, and this is called essence-level reality. And, you know, essence-level reality really stands for experiences of oneness and unity and wholeness. And, and the reason why we talk, we talk about the bottom of the cone is that, you know, the cone comes to this point, right? And that point really stands for where all of reality kind of comes into this one place, okay? So these can be very, very spiritual experiences, essence-level experiences. They're pretty hard to describe to other people. They don't really lend themselves to language very well. Uh, but I think it's worth talking about power when it comes to essence-level experiences, because how much power you have is going to determine how these experiences are seen, okay? So, you know, a privileged uh, essence-level experience might be regarded as spiritual, you're a spiritual person because you're having these experiences. You're hearing the voice of God. Like, wow. Uh, but, you know, if you're marginalized and you're having those experiences, they're not necessarily going to be viewed as spiritual. And instead, they might get diagnosed, pathologized, viewed as psychotic or mentally ill. Uh, so that's really important to, uh, to point that out, that there's a lot of contexts where having essence-level experiences is okay, and there are contexts where it's really bad. You know, essence level experiences can also be just something very normal. Like, for example, if you were having a conversation with someone and you said, wow, you know, you and I aren't so different. Like, I'm kind of realizing we're sort of going through the same thing. That's an essence level experience because I'm having that experience of oneness. It's not the reality that we can all share. And I'm not even talking about my personal feelings. I'm talking about those moments of unity. All levels of reality are important. I want to tell you a little story here. Um, early in my work with Gary Reese, I came into his office and he said, you know, John, I've been thinking about your extreme state. And I'm realizing, you know, you blew up your whole world with this extreme state. You just, you blew it up. You lost everything. It was almost like uh, drinking a whole bottle of Tabasco sauce all at one time. And I remember when Gary said that, I said, oh, you're right. Like, that's exactly it, Gary. That is exactly what it felt like, drinking a whole bottle of Tabasco sauce all at one time. And then Gary said, you know, John, can I make a suggestion to you? That instead of drinking the whole bottle all at once, maybe you just put like a little bit of Tabasco sauce in every meal that you eat. And I thought about that. And he said, yeah, you know, that way you could taste breakfast and you could go, yeah, I taste the spice. And then you could have soup for, for lunch and you taste that spice again, and the spice is just regularly with you, but you don't put so much in that it like blows your circuits and sends you to the hospital. And I thought, yeah, a little bit of Tabasco sauce in everything I eat. And then Gary said the magic words. He said, yes, John, be a little psychotic all the time. And that was huge for me to be told to be a little psychotic all the time. Uh, because what he's saying is, Bring that essence level experience into your daily life. Straddle the levels of reality. Don't get stuck in consensus reality. Don't get stuck in dreamland. Don't get stuck in essence. That sent you to the hospital. Uh, straddle all of them at one time. And I really, really enjoyed that idea. I think about that just about every day because I'm always looking for the magic. I'm always looking for that experience that came in the extreme state. It's with me in my daily life. My job is to recognize it and actually kind of bring it into my awareness. So another way to think of extreme states is when we get stuck in one level of reality. Okay? Can you imagine getting stuck in an essence level of reality? I did. Uh, when I got hospitalized, I was in that essence level place. I was connected to everything. And uh, I would say things like, I am you. Okay? And can you imagine if you walk into a hospital and you say, I am you? 
Okay, that's a that's a tough thing for people to hear if they are kind of married to consensus reality. Uh, you know, you could get stuck in your emotions. Can you imagine being so stuck in your emotions that you can't really deal with consensus reality? Or uh, my favorite, can you imagine getting stuck in consensus reality? Can you imagine getting stuck in a place, the world of facts and figures, uh, in a way where you can't really go into your emotions and you certainly can't go into like an experience of oneness and unity because all you can see is the world that we can all agree on. That's actually a type of extreme state in its own way. So, um, you know, if you're talking to somebody who's maybe not really making sense to you, there might be a little part of you that's tempted to say they're not in touch with reality. And what I want to do is just encourage you to think a little differently uh, that maybe instead of asking if somebody's in touch with reality, ask where are they in the ice cream cone? Okay, because I mean, how could you not be in touch with reality? You're a real person. And if you're a real person and you're having like an unusual experience, to me, that doesn't mean that you're out of reality at all. You're still in reality. You're just maybe experiencing something that's a little different from the rest of us. And the ice cream cone makes plenty of room for those experiences that aren't being shared. Um, and, you know, think about, like, where is somebody in the cone and how fluid are they at being able to move through the cone, okay? So, like, you know, when I was having that experience of thinking that I was the next Dalai Lama, if you had come up to me and said, you know, John, your gas bill is due next week. You know, how are you going to pay it? I would have said, I'm the Dalai Lama. I'm the Dalai Lama. Like, I, I can't get into consensus reality because I'm having this really, really deep essence level experience, and I couldn't straddle the cone. I couldn't move up and down my cone. I got stuck in the bottom of the cone and I got pathologized for that. Okay, so what I've been working on is to grow more fluid in my own cone and encouraging other people to become more fluid in theirs too. Okay, so in process work, uh, there's something called the two-state ethic. And uh, just for a moment, instead of viewing reality as a three-level experience, just imagine that there's two realities. There's the reality that we can share, and then there's this reality that we can't share, okay? And a two-state ethic means that if you're working with somebody who's in a really altered place, that you can live in both states at the same time, okay? I can, I can live in their extreme state. I can actually go there and join them in that place. You think you're the Dalai Lama? Great. What are you going to do next? You know, I'm not going to fight you there. And um, I can hang out in consensus reality at the same time. And I might be able to ask you questions about how are you going to pay your rent, okay? Um, but... I can live in both of those worlds. I don't have to be stuck in consensus reality. And if somebody comes at me who's having like visions or voices, I, I don't want to be in that place where I say, well, because you're experiencing a reality that, that is not mine, then it's not real. Instead, I'm going to straddle. Okay, I'm going to be in both reality we can share. I'm going to join you in the reality that we can't share. And I'm actually going to bridge both worlds at the same time. Now, what are extreme states? You've heard me use this phrase extreme state a couple of times. We're going to start to get a little more technical with process work. Um, these are going to be some more frameworks for how to understand um, uh, what extreme states are. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the inversion, the inverted process structure that was Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Um, we're also going to talk about something called a meta communicator, okay, uh, that when we go into extreme states, we lose the ability to meta communicate. We're going to talk about what that is. A meta communicator is the observer in you. Um, when we go into extreme states, we often have trouble following the feedback of other people. And in process work, that's called a feedback loop. We have a reduced feedback loop. And uh, I put this wave up there to describe that in extreme states, that's usually like when the state kind of takes us over, kind of crashes on us. Uh, I know for me, like when I was in an extreme state, I, I had very little agency uh, over consensus reality. And instead, all the themes that were emerging in the extreme state were just coming at me so strong. I really didn't feel like I could believe anything else. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the hot potato. Okay, Extreme states happen um, when others won't pick up their own madness. Okay, so like when the when the broader group, kind of the broader public or mainstream, when they won't pick up their own sense of madness, then that's going to land on people really, really hard. That's the city shadow concept. Okay, so what is a meta communicator? Okay, um, there's a part of all of us that we call the meta communicator, and that's like the observer in us. That's the part of us that's sitting up in the balcony, and it's like looking down at the whole theater from this elevated position and can actually see like pretty much not only the whole show, but also the whole audience. Um, and so that's the part of me that's sort of sitting up there, and it's looking down, and it's saying, oh, wow, John, you know, I noticed that you're sitting at your computer giving a webinar right now. 
and I notice that maybe you're a little cold. Like, you know, I just notice those different experiences in myself. Uh, that's the inner observer in me. That's the observer that's like watching. Okay, we usually take that part of ourselves for granted because that part of ourselves that observe, that's observing is usually like part of the scene. Uh, and, you know, the meta communicator is like a weather reporter. Can you imagine that? Like, it's, it's the person who's keeping the awareness, the awareness keeper. They're holding the awareness, and they're sharing that awareness with the, the viewers. And it's really a matter of, like, noticing and reporting what's there, you know? It's not a matter of, like, judging what's there. I'm not judging um, the temperature of the, you know, the weather. I'm not judging the weather conditions. I'm just noticing what they are. I'm not creating uh, the weather either. I'm just noticing what it is, okay? Um, now, imagine if you have no meta communicator. Okay, imagine if, the, if you lose that part of yourself that's capable of like observing and noticing what's happening. And uh, you know, in this I would illustrate that as like somebody who is in the theater, but they're in the seats. They're not in that elevated position looking down. They're like right in it. That's a good image for what I imagine what we're like when we don't really have so much of a meta communicator. Um, and you know, like when I was in the state, I, I didn't say, you know, I'm really noticing that I'm feeling very rich and abundant. Okay, that's 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 meta communication. That's the the observer might say that. Instead, it was like, oh my God, I'm a trillionaire. I'm the Dalai Lama. I cure cancer. Okay, so th that part of me that can notice what's happening is gone. Okay, and instead, I'm like in it. I'm in the state. Uh, that's a hallmark of extreme states in the process work model is that we lose the ability to observe ourselves and meta communicate. Now, if you're talking to somebody who doesn't have a strong meta communicator. Consider becoming it for them, okay? It's almost like there's a job for hire, you know? And that job is available, and if you want to apply and become the weather reporter, go for it. Uh, so that would mean um, noticing what is happening um, and making it known, like bringing it to the awareness of the person who's actually experiencing it. And again, you know, as the weather reporter, I'm not judging what's happening, and I'm not making anything happen. I'm noticing what's happening, and I'm calling it out. Okay. Now, if you um, talk to somebody who seems to be in an extreme state, it's, it's not a total absence of metacommunication. It's that that observer in them is maybe a little reduced, really a little bit more distant. Well, find it, okay? Because there, there will be times where people speak and you do notice that they're speaking from that elevated position and kind of see the whole scene. And if you notice that, hang on to it, okay? Reel it into the boat. It's biting on your line. Reel it in. And stay there because momentary metacommunication can actually be amplified and can grow. And when we have total metacommunication, well, in a way, that's kind of like a normal state of being. Okay. What is a feedback loop? You know, I mentioned that in extreme states, sometimes we uh, have trouble following the feedback of other people. Uh, you know, a feedback loop for me, a great way to describe it is these kids in the classroom, like they're kind of out of control. And then the teacher arrives and she's pretty angry and very stern. And she whaps the table with her ruler and says, behave. And, you know, if the kids in the class have an active feedback loop, then this is what's going to happen. Okay, they're going to follow the signals of the teacher and adjust their behavior uh, in response to those signals, okay? It's something that we tend to sort of take for granted. But when we go into extreme states, sometimes we lose the uh, part of us that can follow the signals of other people. So if you're talking to somebody who doesn't seem to have that, who doesn't seem to be able to kind of follow the feedback of other people, do what you did with the meta communicator, find it, okay? Because that part of us that is responding to other people, that's certainly there. It might just be really diminished and kind of faint. But if you notice it in any way, if you notice someone responding to somebody else, stay there, okay? Notice that and reel that into the boat as well because those little moments of having feedback awareness, those moments can be amplified. And again, having a, an intact feedback loop, well, that's like a normal state of mind, okay? All right. Now, now in process work, uh, we talk a lot about theory, we talk a lot about skills, but then we also talk a lot about attitudes. And I think that the attitudes are just as important as the theory or the skills, maybe even more important. These are called meta skills in process work. It's not, it's not how you paint. It's not, it's not, yeah, it's not that you're painting. It's how you hold the brush. Can you imagine that? It's the attitude that you have behind what you're doing. And I think there's some really important meta skills in process work to consider. And, you know, I imagine process work is like driving a car, okay? Because when I'm driving my car, I follow what's happening, okay? I'm going to respond to my environment, and I'm going to follow. I'm going to go with the flow of whatever is occurring. Is there traffic in front of me? I can deal with that. Is everyone going faster? I can deal with that, too. But I'm not going to come in with, like, a preconceived notion of how I'm going to flow, because if I do that, I'll probably crash. 
I am responding to what's coming, okay? And I'm kind of taking whatever comes. Uh, but just think about that the next time you're driving a car. That's actually a very process-oriented uh, attitude to have. Something valuable is always trying to make itself known in unusual states of mind. Um, it's, remember the trash, it's not junk, okay? It's gold. And it may not be easy to understand, and it may be disturbing, but it's still gold. And uh, just keep that faith that something important is trying to emerge all the time. Some more useful attitudes, um, you know, this might seem obvious, but the people in extreme states are actually human beings. <laughs> and uh, I remember in mine, you know, when I was so altered, my, in, my emotions were completely intact. And I had feelings, you know, and I could, those feelings could be hurt. Uh, it wasn't like being altered, it diminished me of my emotions. Uh, you know, when you're working with somebody in an extreme state, be a beginner. Don't, don't assume that you know everything or even know anything. Uh, and don't go too fast. You know, we were talking about that mountain with the edges. You know, not all edges actually need to be crossed. The point in process work is not to cross every edge. It's to have awareness of what's on the other side. And a lot of people can have awareness without jumping over an edge. And to believe in, in anyone's um, capacity for power and judgment, uh, even if they are acting in an altered way, I think that when we release believing in people's power and judgment, that's a pathologizing thing to do. Okay, that's, that's where we get back into that mental illness thing. And, you know, we're talking a lot about making meaning from unusual states. Not everyone is ready to make meaning, okay? Some unusual states are very, very scary. And just recognize that intense suffering might be present and sit with that uh, before you go into making meaning. Not everyone's ready to do that yet. And remember that, you know, extreme states don't really belong to the people who are having those states. Uh, those states actually belong to all of us. They're like the hot potato. And if we could own our extreme states a little bit more, then maybe they wouldn't land on other people. But that, that means that unusual states actually belong to all of us. I, um, when, when I was in an extreme state, I, I, had, I, I spoke in a way that people didn't understand. And I, I heard the phrase word salad. I was once told that I was a wall of words. Okay, And I just want to speak to this concept of word salad because it's almost as bad as the word pathologizing to me. It's kind of a four-letter word. And I just want to say that, you know, when I was going really fast and I was kind of moving from symbol to symbol and I had this very like loose kind of stream of consciousness type of thinking, I didn't make sense to other people, but I made perfect sense to myself. Inside, it was very clear what was happening. It was a, it was a metaphorical experience. I was talking in symbols. I was viewing life in symbols. And so my communication and behavior were also deeply symbolic. But the problem was that when I got to the hospital, I was viewed literally. Okay, so like when I started talking about nuclear weapons in the hospital, they were taking me serious, like I was really talking about nukes, when maybe I was talking about power, you know, or maybe I was talking about the ability to defend myself or something. Nuclear weapons stood for something else. I wasn't speaking literally, but you know, when people were taking me literally, like I, I was seen as dangerous, but I think taken metaphorically, I could be understood a little bit better. And I want to encourage you to uh, employ that attitude next time you're talking to somebody who has a language that you don't understand. Now we're getting close to the end. I, I just want to introduce, uh, this is an idea, this is called channels of awareness. And the idea here in process work is that there are like these different modes in ourselves that we can receive information that kind of bubbles up into our consciousness. And here are some of them, you know, like visual, like I could tell you that I'm seeing something, okay? Or I could even try to like draw it out for you. That's a visual channel. An audi auditory channel would maybe be that I'm hearing bells. Or maybe I'm describing to you what I'm hearing. Or maybe I'm making sound myself. That's all auditory. And, you know, the channels keep going. I can, I can get into how I feel in my body. I can get into movement. A lot of people express themselves in movement, as I'm doing right here with my hand. You know, extreme states, there's a lot of movement in extreme states where people are expressing themselves in that movement. Remember that that's a, that's a completely legitimate channel of communication. It's not like all communication needs to take place in someone's language. Okay, open yourself up to other channels. Another channel is relationship, okay? So like if I tell you about my relationship with someone, that's an entire channel of its own uh, to get into the relationships we have with other people and things. And finally, the environment. This is called the world channel. And the idea here is that some part of our awareness is actually expressing itself in our environment. Have you ever walked by a, a light and it suddenly turned off when you got near it? Or like I have a clock that stopped in the house. And there have been a couple times where I came home with really strong feelings and the clock actually started again, briefly. And then when I left again, it stopped. That's the world channel. That's the part of my awareness that's expressing itself in my world around me. Uh, now, the reason I show you the channels 
is that this is the key to reaching people who are unreachable, okay, or quote unquote unreachable. Because imagine if someone's words aren't really making sense, well then that means that their auditory channel maybe isn't the place where they have the most awareness. But maybe someone's moving in a different way and maybe the movement is more clear. That's, that means that their movement channel is more occupied, okay? Now imagine if you're, um, well, the biggest advice I can give you is to go to where the energy is, Okay, so like if you're talking to somebody and they're silent, then change channels, okay, because there's nothing on that channel, so I, I need to change the channel. And maybe say, well, I'm noticing that you're not really speaking right now, but, you know, could you express yourself in, in a movement or a gesture? And, you know, I've done this before where someone seems like a brick wall, and then you take out their remote, you change the channel, you ask them to maybe express it in a drawing. And then the following day, they have like a smart, small portfolio of drawings that they've given you to show just how strong that visual channel is. So just think about that. You got the remote control in your hand. You're talking to somebody. They're not making sense. Switch channels. See if you can get them to go into one of those other channels. You may find that there's all kinds of awareness there that you didn't know before. And uh, this is going to be my last slide here, and that's, uh, this is something called the four phases. They call it the four phases of conflict, and it's, it's not conflict with other people necessarily. These are four phases that can also be used to refer to our own inner conflicts. And, you know, when I facilitate the Hearing Voices group, I think of myself as like a, I'm like a cowboy on my horse. And someone can come in and they can describe what their experience is, and my job is to just ride my horse next to theirs, you know? and get a feel for what their world is like. What does life look like from their horse? And uh, one of the reasons I use the four phases is that there are four distinct different postures that people can take when it comes to unusual states of mind. And uh, generally we only know two of these, but there's actually four. And the, the first posture that people have is, I, there's nothing wrong. Like I don't acknowledge that there's anything wrong. You know, sure, I hear voices, but it's not really a problem for me. This is the way it's always been. Okay, that's kind of life as usual, sort of no problems. And, you know, if somebody says that there's no problems, I'm not going to tell them there's a problem. I'm going to hang out with them, hang out in that phase. Oh, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. I see it, right. Now, that second phase of conflict is where most of us sort of think conflict occurs, which is the phase of making things go away. Okay, so like, for example, when I went into the hospital, the hospital was in that second phase. The hospital was like, you've got a problem, it needs to go away now, make it go away. And that's where mental illness falls. Okay, mental illness is a very phase two kind of concept because, again, it says that something needs to go away. That's what, uh, that's sort of what I thought was like conflict before I got into process work school. I thought that conflict was fighting, you know, one of us needs to leave the island. Uh, but that's actually not true. There's other postures that we can take uh, in relation to things that bother us. Now that third posture is a little hard to describe, okay? But imagine that you're, um, you know, you're, you're fighting with somebody and then you actually steal their energy, okay? Which means sort of becoming them just a little bit and actually taking some of that energy by becoming like them, okay? That's, that's a little different, okay? Now imagine if I said, um, you know, I had this extreme state in my life and it came into my life and it shook me. Well, maybe I need to become the shaker. You know, I need to become that. I need to actually start to become the shaker myself. Uh, do you see what I mean? That's actually becoming a little bit like the thing that made that energy come in, okay? That's a, that's a role switching position where I actually become my opponent ever so briefly, okay? Um, and then, you know, the fourth phase is, is a phase of unity, okay? That's like a phase, it's kind of down at the bottom of the ice cream cone. And that would be the phase where there is no polarity anymore, okay? There's, there's nothing in my life that I want to make go away. Uh, the thing that I want to go away and I are one, okay? We're all one thing, so I can't really look at duality anymore. And, it, you know, a phase like that when it comes to altered states would be being a little psychotic all the time, okay? It would be bringing in the energy of altered states on a constant level so that I don't really have to fight it anymore. And the four phases, I mean, we could have a whole hour long talk just on these phases, but I really like those because it gives me the ability to walk next to people, no matter what their relationship is. Um, and, you know, I don't try to like nudge people into a whole new phase. I might throw out a few clues and just see if somebody will take it. And if they don't take it, I know where they are, you know, and I'm not going to try to force someone away. Um, but those are really, really useful. I use those all the time. 
you know, the bottom line uh, that I want to impart upon you is that when I was in this extreme state, I was absolutely still a human being, even if I had beliefs that were different from everyone else. And there were some people who could reach me. Okay, I actually had a few friends who they treated me in a way where I really felt like we were actually having real dialogue and conversation. And in those conversations, I could feel the alteredness actually come down. Okay, and I wonder why is it that uh, talking to some people made me feel so much more human? And I think the reason is it has to do with pathologizing. Okay, that when I was pathologized, when I was viewed as sick, it actually made me more altered. I actually got into a more extreme state of uh, being seen as ill. But when I was viewed as a whole person, I actually became more aware. Okay? And uh, I, I firmly believe that. It's, it's part of my own experience. It's part of the experience I have in, in working with other people, is viewing people as whole is actually something that can help uh, de-escalate uh, unusual states. I would love to take questions from the group. I'm so happy to have made it through all my slides. And uh, um, yeah, I would just love to open it up and interact. Um, and see if you have any questions that I can answer. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jen, um, let's see. She says, one thing you mentioned early on about your own relationship with your experience was don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's a phrase used in the book, unshrinking psychosis. Um, let's see, I'm having a hard time getting <laughs> this cool question. Um, I, I can pick it up. Suggest after an extreme and altered state, uh, just keep keep what was working for you, the value, which brings me to my last comment. I attended the film Hearing Vo Healing Voices in Vancouver a few years ago. When I sat down in the large audience, I felt the word value come to me. It was as people's truths were speaking to me. There is value to these extreme and altered states. I feel that you did a great job at nurturing our own and society's view and recognizing and maintaining all that precious value. Thank you. That, what a lovely comment. Beautiful. Yes, throwing, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? I mean, that was for me, that was the year 2013, because in that year, I was throwing it out. And I uh, just really thought that it was kind of a useless experience. And yeah, maintaining that meaning and bringing that in, that's been a really, really important piece. Yeah. And thank you, Carl Jung. Right. <laughs> lovely question. comments there. Yeah, one question I have, um, you were talking about how to bridge two states at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have more you could say about that. That sounded so fascinating and so important mm -hmm. in, in trying to reach people. And so I don't know if you have any examples or if you can just say a little more about that. Well, I see, I, see, I see moving up and down the cone. Okay, so... You know, if someone's having an experience of oneness, you know, like like believing that the the, the the Dalai Lama, for example, I can go down the con the cone and I can join them in that experience. Like, I'm not going to say, no, you're not the Dalai Lama. Come on, get real. You know, that's that's the extreme state of being locked in consensus reality. So, to me, the two state ethic is I can go with you, I can join you there, and we can mine that experience for meaning. Okay, like we can wring it out like a sponge. There's got to be something really valuable about being the Dalai Lama. Let's go there. And I can stay in consensus reality and realize that like laws of nature are perfectly intact. The material world is still here and, and bridge those two places. Um, you know, I might join you in being the Dalai Lama and then come back and start asking consensus reality questions like how much sleep have you had? You know, have you had lunch? Uh, to me, that's two state ethic. Okay, because I'm not disregarding your belief, but I'm also not abdicating consensus reality either. And I'm kind of straddling both worlds at the same time. I don't know if that helps. Some therapists call it the, what do they call it? Like colluding with the delusion. I've heard that kind of language before. Like somebody thinks they're the Dalai Lama. You can't go there. Don't go there. You're just going to feed the delusion and make it worse. And in process work, we, we just don't view it that way, that there's something in that experience that's really important. Let's go there and wring it out for all the meaning that we can and live in consensus reality at the same time. Okay. So I noticed Robin has a question. How do you have a real conversation with someone who's involved in a traditional model such as NAMI? Mm, we're great. Well, that, that's, what a great question. You know, I use the four phases of conflict uh, when I talk to people from NAMI. And again, you know, NAMI is very different from chapter to chapter. There's a great diversity in the attitudes that I've seen people uh, facilitating NAMI groups. But when I uh, interact with people who believe in the medical model, 
I use the phases because I realize, oh, okay, they're in phase two. They want this experience to go away. Okay, I can work with that. I can ride my horse next to theirs. Yep, cool. And then I might, you know, give them a little nudge. You know, like we're riding our horses next to each other and I can just give them a little, a little tap. And I might say something like, you know, I had things that happened in my experience that were, they were crazy. That's true. That's me pacing them. And, you know, I hear these bells and the bells tell me yes and no. And they're still with me today and they're very valuable and important. What would you say to that? So that's me like trying to nudge them into another phase, actually trying to kind of, hey, maybe you don't need to be completely against this the whole time. And there are parts of my experience that I can be against. So I'm going to pace that attitude. I'm going to gently nudge it to come over to my point of view. I find that that nudging is more helpful than jousting. Okay, I've, I've jousted a number of people where they say, that's mental illness. And then I try to knock them off their horse and they say, no, it isn't. Okay, that generally doesn't work. In fact, somebody might say that I'm showing symptoms <laughs> by being so passionate. So I, I think taking the kind of softer approach is useful and realizing that um, persuasion can happen. But sometimes it's real subtle at first. I also, you know, I also go back to my own experience real quick. I just go back to my own experience. There was a time where I took psychiatric drugs and it was helpful. And there was a time where wanting my experience to go away was helpful. So I can identify with being in that phase. And I'm not in that phase anymore. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. So Jennifer has a question. What about when altered states lead to destructive behaviors, cutting or even suicidal thoughts or of harmful mm -hmm. to others? How, mm -hmm. how to deal with that as a parent, for example? Yeah. Well, you know, kind of going back to the cone here that, you know, if someone, um, well, like in my situation, you know, I was really starting to agitate people to the point where I was running the risk of being a, a victim of violence. Uh, because I was you know, kind of for forcing people into a violent place. You know, that's consensus reality, right? Like if I get hurt or if I hurt myself, that's a consensus reality issue. And consensus reality isn't going away. Okay, so to me, you know, all three levels matter, including the level of reality that we can all agree on. So, you know, like cutting is, is dangerous. It can be risky. That's a consensus reality issue. Um, we know, you know, when it comes to suicide, um, you know, I'm sure everyone is so different, and it's such a heavy topic, and, and one of the big values in process work is to always follow the feedback of who you're talking to. So it's a little bit hard to talk about suicide without having someone's feedback to really kind of work with. Um, but in times in my life uh, where I've wanted to die, uh, I've gone into it. I've actually moved into that experience. Uh, is there something in that experience of dying that might actually be useful? The big mistake that I made was that I thought that all of me needed to die. And what I like to do instead is think of myself in terms of parts. Okay, so yes, there was a part of me that really wanted to die. I sometimes think there was a part of me that needed to die. And there was a part of me that needed to do some killing too. Okay, but it wasn't all of me. It wasn't all of myself that, that was there. Um, I believe that those experiences are really important. I don't believe in ignoring them. Um, and, you know, yeah, I'm... I'm uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm against suicide. I'm against killing all of ourselves, but I sometimes would like to explore maybe which part wants to die. And again, I, I find myself feeling a little nervous in saying that just because I can't really see the feedback um, in response to what I'm saying. So kind of speaking into the, what feels like the empty air around something as deep as suicide feels, I don't know, I think I feel a little self-conscious there, but that's some of the thinking that I... That I... Okay. Yeah, I noticed... Human saying, um, my son has terrifying voices and hallucinations and fights and shouts with them to go away. How would you work mm -hmm. with him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, it's hard to know uh, because there's going to be feedback there if I were in front of this person that I can't really anticipate. And uh, part of process work is just following the process wherever it happens to go. Um, you know, those phases are useful. Like if someone's hearing distressing voices and they really want them to go away, I'm, I'm not going to change that attitude. I can be for the fact that they want them to go away. But what about that third phase? Okay, that third, third phase is kind of interesting. That's the one where you borrow the energy from your opponent. So, and again, not everybody's ready for this. This is where feedback is just so incredibly critical. But if he were interested in moving beyond that place of making it go away, I might ask something like, well... Who, who is this voice in your life? Like, what are they like? You know, can you imagine, like, what are they, what are they like when they first wake up in the morning? You know, what, how do they walk? Can you imagine that? Like, do they walk a certain way? 
And, you know, if I could get someone to even imagine that, uh, then what would it be like to try walking that way? Just a little, you know, actually become a little bit more like that in our daily lives. That's a way of picking up the energy, stealing the energy from this thing that's making the voice happen. And it's not that it's really making the voice happen. We're just imagining that. But that's a way of actually getting into the energy. It's again, remember the knocking on the door? Maybe a disturbing voice is there, okay? And it's knocking on the door. It's trying to get something known. It's trying to bring something forward that's useful and valuable. It doesn't mean that I have to do what the voices are telling me, but it might be maybe there's an energy behind the thing that's making these voices happen. And how can I somehow pick up a little bit more of that energy into my daily life? Again, speaking into the, the open air, it feels a little funny to say this because when I propose ideas like that, I'm watching feedback. I'm watching the feedback of the person because they might say, hell no, I ain't going there. Okay, all right, back off. I'm not gonna joust you off your horse, that's cool. But sometimes people might think about that. They might say no at first and then a little later they might say, you know, I was thinking about that. I, was th I drew a picture of this character and, and I started realizing like maybe I could become a little bit more like that myself. I hope that's a helpful idea. Yeah, yeah that, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. So Stephen's wondering, as I was working, attempting to support a peer who wasn't speaking in the hospital emergency room. This person was someone I had worked with on my job. I asked permission to be present and didn't really get a response. What are some of the ways to switch the channel or remain present with that person? Right. Take out your remote, right? Point it at them. No. <laughs> um, you know, if someone's not speaking, then... Are they completely absent of signal? <laughs> you know, can you imagine me not speaking? I've got my hands here. Can you imagine me saying nothing? And then a little something in my hand, right? You know, I watch people's entire bodies when they speak and or when they're not speaking. Like if someone's not speaking, I'm going to look for movement. Is there any movement there? Even if it was just a little something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap onto that. I'm going to say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm seeing your hand move. Let's go with that. I might resist their hand. Or I might make their hand move bigger, but that the movement suddenly becomes the thing that I'm attached to, okay? Or what if you, if somebody wasn't uh, speaking and you handed them a pad and paper and said, I don't know, I feel like sketching something out, drawing, doodling, you know? Um, you feel like, you know, yeah, it, you're going to movement. How are you feeling in your body right now? Again, it's going into those channels and you might ask a question like, you know, what are you noticing in your body? And if there's still silence, then, there's nothing on, right? Now in process work, uh, you can uh, try something three times, okay? So, you know, if you ask somebody to go into movement and they said, not gonna do it, you know? Well, then you might ask a second or even third time, but if they still say no after three, then it's not worth going there. It's, there's nothing on that channel. Um, but I firmly believe that awareness is present all the time. And there is something on, on at least one of those channels, probably more. And just to open your mind to not worrying so much about what comes out of people's mouths. There's something coming through all of their awareness. And what comes out of our mouths is only an auditory channel. Yeah, good. So Val says, I love the phrase consensus reality. Is it suggested to teach the client about this concept as well as meet them in their delusion to find the meaning? Oh, yeah, to teach, like, to, to so, so, so simultaneously join someone in the bottom of the cone and teach them about the cone. That's kind of what I'm hearing said. I, I do that all the time. I'm, I'm constantly pushing that cone. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned the cone with people who are not in consensus reality. And uh, it's okay. You know, I'm always interested in trying to teach some of the ideas and employ them at the same time. Not everyone is theoretical. I personally really like theory. I kind of geek out on it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm using these techniques and teaching them simultaneously. And that was, that was what Gary did with me. You know, Gary regards people who have extreme states as um, people who are kind of going through a training. And uh, that, was, that was really our work together as a training. I love these questions and all the, the feedback, yeah. What if the essence experience is persecutory? Mm, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What if it is? I'm thinking about that. You know, my um, 
my essence level experiences were by and large positive, um, but I can imagine having a sense of oneness with something that isn't positive. And um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think uh, I don't really have an answer for you right there, other than that I am not opposed to negativity. Okay, I, I believe that negativity actually can have something really important to teach us. Um, but I also believe in our right to avoid distress if that's what we need. So, you know, I'm not sure what to say about that if we have an essence level experience that's distressing. I wonder then, you know, how uh, can you move up and down the cone? You know, if the bottom of the cone is a distressing experience, can you move up into dreamland or can you move up into consensus reality and hang out there for a little bit and then drop back down and, and just check to see if the relationship has changed? I don't really know. It's a good question. Great question. I think sometimes if people can find a way to be grounded in consensus reality like hey i'm actually in a room and nothing's going on and i'm, I'm actually really safe here and i don't know what this other experience in essence is going on but hey, i'm kind of safe here and so maybe i can just calm down a little and then i can go back and re-experience that a little bit and a lot of people have noticed that if you're experiencing essence level reality but you're in a state of feeling threatened it's really scary because like being one with everything and having no boundaries is fine if everything's okay. But if there's a sense that there's something threatening, you have no boundary against it. It's like, oh my gosh, where do I stop it? Oh no. All my thoughts can be read by everyone and they're more like, ah. <laughs> well, I remember cutting wires in my house. I actually like cut some pretty big wires in my house because I was so convinced that I was being listened to every conversation I was being listened to. And that, that was a pretty scary experience, not only for me, but the people around me. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting too, that, you know, part of the extreme state was this sense that everyone could read my mind, read my thoughts, listen to my calls, and they were documenting everything I was doing. Okay. So that was the delusion, right? And then I went to the hospital and guess what? That's what happened. There are these people at computers. They're listening to everything I say. They're typing out every word into this record that I don't know where it's going. You know, so in a way, like there's an example of like, you know, well-founded paranoia <laughs> uh, and that there's something in the experience that actually was in consensus reality or I was almost like predicting something that was about to happen in consensus reality. That was trippy. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I really look forward to going through these comments. Mm. Uh, there's one question. Are, are you going to give access to your PowerPoint slides? Do you want me to oh, give access to those? Ab okay. Absolutely, yes. Uh, however you want to do it, Ron, I can put my email address. People can email me and I can send them. Or if I can share them with you, and can send them to the broader group. I'm more than happy to. Yes, I'm very, very open with my information. I want it to be shared. I wonder what would work best, uh, an email address or? Yeah, you know, I, I, I have um, a, a way to just share a link to them if that's okay. Put them on a... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll get them to you and we'll send them. Yeah. Yeah. We already, yeah. Th okay. Thanks for asking, by the way. Okay. Um, Tracy's asking if, do you know if there is a list or a website where there's a national network of process work specialists? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a list at the Process Work website, processwork.edu. Uh, there's a list of diplomates. Those are people who have the next degree in process work after the master's. That's kind of considered the terminal degree in process work. And there is a list there of diplomates throughout the world. Um, as far as, yeah, other places where we can, where there's like a, like a registry, I'm thinking about that. I'm not, nothing's coming off the top of my head. There is an International Association of, uh, for Process-Oriented Psychology, I, IAPOP, I-A-P-O-P. Um, you could Google search that uh, because process work is actually an international uh, school of psychology. It's worldwide. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some kind of a listing there. Um, process work also has a pretty vibrant community on Facebook as well, if you're on social media. Um, but, you know, I probably, I would recommend getting in touch with the Process Work Institute because they're, they're really going uh, to have the most information. Processwork.edu. So, Jamie has a question. I have my demons and they're there because I've walked in the valley of the shadow of death. It's BS to say I fear no evil, mm. but are they evil? Mm. 
Hi, Jamie. <laughs> um, well, gosh, I don't know. I, you know, I want to follow you. You know, I think like saying whether they're evil or not is in a way kind of a way of leading. And, uh, you know, not only do I not know, but I also don't have your feedback to respond to. So it's really hard to say uh, if something's evil and, and is there really such a thing? I don't know. There, you know. Part of me really wants to honor and value an important message that's trying to come forward, even if it's disturbing. So I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Are they evil? I'm really curious what you think. Oh, there's one question. I don't know if I know how to say this because it's a word. I don't know. Thoughts on enantiodromia or the tendency for something to turn into its opposed quality. Okay, so there's a, it's defined there. It's, it's really about tendency for something to turn into its opposed quality. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. You know, even without feeling new to that word, the tendency for something to become its own kind of opposite. Uh, that, I really like that. Um, hmm, just trying to feel where my mind is going there. I, I think what it says to me is that what feels like polarity, you know, what feels like being on opposite sides is actually a much more fluid phenomenon than we imagine, and that, that each one kind of contains the seed of the other, and that we can then actually start to go into that phase three, right, that place of role switching and change, um, you know, just noticing the change for me feels really good. Noticing that things can flip and uh, switch around. I think that that sensitivity to the movement and noticing the movement happening, that feels really important. Yeah, I could think about that for a long time. Thanks for the new vocabulary there. That's great. And Jamie's saying, what do you think about how so many of us share the same things that are quote, illness. Maybe it's the question is about how, how when we're experiencing what gets called illness, we often go through some similar things or we often share similar patterns. Yeah, well, that's probably been the most healing part for me of making friends who have also had extreme states because it's very interesting to kind of run our stories by each other and notice uh, some of the similarities and a lot of the differences. Um, but, you know, I just had a conversation with uh, my friend Danielle, and she was describing parts of her experience that I hadn't even remembered in mine, because that's how few people I've run into who really have been there. And when she started describing her experience, even after six years of sort of developing greater safety, I felt even safer. Something kind of dropped in even more in just hearing her describe her experience. Because again, you know, essence level experiences are very hard to lend themselves to language. They're hard to describe. And uh, some of my best moments have been with other experiencers and who actually have had some success at being able to articulate what that was like. I felt really unified there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question about why, why the experiences are common. It's, it almost makes me think like something's knocking at our, at our door as a society and it's trying to teach us something really big and it, kind of using individuals and putting them into extreme states to kind of let the broader group know something that's really meaningful and important. Yeah, these are great questions. I wish I, I, wish I had uh, more concrete answers. Uh, well, let's see. I think there's a relationship between them. So I think the Gestalt therapy is actually one of the uh, elements that led to the creation of process work. So, um, you know, there's a lot of movement, a lot of focus on what is unintended. Uh, yeah, or being able to like sum up your whole thing in one movement and then get into that movement and start mining for meaning. I'm not a, I'm not a Gestalt expert, uh, but my therapist was, was Gestalt for a long time. Um, so yeah, I think that there is a relationship between them. Process work it tries to integrate, um, and it's almost like a, uh, how would you say, like a meta philosophy. Uh, it's a philosophy that tries to incorporate all these other branches of psychology and actually kind of create a framework that can, uh, yeah, it can kind of shine light on all of them. Wow. Wow. I don't know. That's so interesting to think. Eye contact from the people who loved him. 
I don't know. You know, I, I can speculate, um, but it's, it's just such blind speculation. I'm not really following your process at all by saying this. I, you know, for me, there's something about how I was observed, how I was looked at that really made a difference. And I don't know if it was a matter of direct eye contact as much as, as it was the kind of sentiments that seemed to be behind people who were looking at me. There were like little ways that they could look at me that I found really difficult. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'd love to explore that together as to what happened when eye contact was made. What did you notice? You know, where did you notice it in your body? Where, where in your awareness did that drive to look away show itself in, in, your, in, your, in yourself? Um, so yeah, again, I have, it's probably frustrating to hear, but I have so much, so many more questions than answers. Uh, I'd be interested in like really following that and seeing where it takes us. But I don't know why that is. I know eye contact can be really intense, and uh, I, you know some people say that eye contact can be like a predatory thing. You know, some dogs don't like direct eye contact. Um, but as far as why that would be uh, so difficult in an extreme state, I've, I'm really left with a lot of curiosity there. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, when I, when I propose process-oriented thinking or I start asking those questions, there's part of me that's always watching and watching to see what your feedback is when I throw out these ideas. And if you get energetic, well, then we're going to go there. And if you're not so energetic, then maybe I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm not hitting you, you know, I'm not touching you. And so it's, uh, yeah, sometimes a little weird to kind of be speaking into the open air without being able to see the feedback as I, as I say these ideas, just to check them out, whether they're lighting you up or not, because that's for me what it's all about. It's me speaking and watching you and seeing where you go. You're the one who's really kind of leading me and letting me know where the juice is. Right. Yeah, that's great. So Jamie says, in my group, someone um, will come in for the first time and talk about a quote, whip, shadow figure that moved too fast to be real and seems to slide behind something. And many of us know exactly what that person is talking about because we also have them. How is that, quote, in your head? Or my primary voice that I see clearly other voices can hear as a mumble or, or vision seers can see as a shadow? What are your feelings about mm. shared delusions mm. or hallucinations? Mm. Wow. Yeah, where to, where, to, where to take that? How is that in your head? Right, you know, I'm actually not convinced that voices are in our head. I'm actually not convinced that our brains are in our head or that our thoughts are in our brains. You know, so I, I, I don't take any of that for granted. Uh, and that's, that kind of takes me back to the virtual interpretation of reality. I, I believe that we're living in a virtual reality, not a not a real reality, as it were, a material reality. So the idea of things being in our heads or not in our heads is a, a it's not the so framework. Carl that asks, why is eye contact? Um, yeah, uh, no. so a shared delusion. You know, a shared states. delusion. That's a good question. So if it's shared, then that's kind of there's something that's a little consensus reality like. Uh, if it's an experience that's shared between people. Uh, and the idea of like a shared experience of, of non-shared reality, that's uh, very interesting to me. That kind of makes me think that the ice cream cone might be a little too simple. That two people could have a shared experience, and that shared experience is not shared by the broader group. That it just, it, 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 uh, I, get, I smell complexity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and how do complexes play into this, Carl asks? Are complexes always linked with neurosis? Uh, well, neurosis is, in a way, it's kind of a word that I don't even know. Um, we talk about complexes quite a bit in, a, in, in process work. Um, uh, extreme states sometimes happen around complexes. Um, I think of complexes as like a, I'm sure I could say this better, but like an early wound. Uh, there's an early wound in our lives, and then we get kind of reminded of that wound throughout our lives and then develop a reaction to that wound wherever it shows up. That's sort of my, in my mind, kind of an imagination. That's what I imagine when I think of a complex. Um, and that, yeah, when complexes get really steep and sometimes altered states come about, um, 
you know, it just speaks to how much material we've covered in the process work program. I have this huge binder of all the notes that I've taken. And uh, there is, there's, there's some material there about the relationship between complexes and extreme states. And I think that's, that's part of my future learning. It's not something that I have really down in my head to be able to just speak off the top of my head. That's, uh, that's kind of future study. Yeah, I told you I'm a beginner, right? <laughs> I've only been working at, I've only been uh, thinking about process work for about four years now. So I'm four years into my 10 year uh, trajectory of learning. You're a very articulate beginner, though. So. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Um, I have a question. You may have already spoken about this, but can you speak to, quote, insight? There are a number of schools of thought about insight being necessary to recovery. Then there is research that proposes that individuals who do not have insight tend to recover and have a more functional, stable lives. No, oh, I like it. Well, let's let's think. What is insight? Okay, what does insight mean? Like when I think insight, I think meta communication. Okay, I think is there part of you that's up there and kind of see the whole scene? That's what I think of with insight. But I know that insight means something else. Okay, like the cynic in me says that the word insight means that you agree with your diagnosis. Okay, like if you've been called schizophrenic and you agree, well now you have insight into your illness. You know, which me that's not insight. That's compliance. You know, that's, that's being uh, taken over by something that's more powerful. So that's interesting to think about what that word really means, because, yeah, if you don't have insight, then you don't believe in your illness. Well, I don't believe in your illness. <laughs> I don't believe in my illness. You know, I don't view it in terms of illness. Does that mean that I lack insight? <laughs> I think I've got some insight. Uh, I've got good metacommunication. I may not agree with the paradigm that's being thrust upon me. Does that mean that I lack insight? Good, really good question. To me, insight is awareness. Do you have awareness? And, uh, you know, altered states kind of go with lack of awareness. That's kind of what they are. They're, they're places where we get into ourselves where we don't have that kind of awareness. I'm interested in, in uh, getting as much awareness as possible. Um, but yeah, insight feels like a pretty loaded word. Interesting. Yeah, I'd love to hear when someone uses that word, like, stop for a sec. What do you mean by that insight? Like, talk to me. Because isn't there a diagnostic label for not believing in your illness? With asignosia, isn't that what it's called? It's like, you don't believe that you're sick? Well, you're sick because of that. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you know, you can't get away. Hard to escape the pathologizing framework. Yeah. These are great questions. They're like uh, such, such new, uh, you know, we could, we could, we could have, a, you know, week-long gatherings just to explore these questions. These are so good. Yeah, but if you run out of energy and want to stop, we can. But we can also keep going. Oh, let's the, yeah. In the in the spirit of following what's alive, okay. let's let's follow what's alive. All right. Well, Jen has a. How does process work view the quote renewal through the center process? That's the process as John Weir Perry described it. I don't know if you're familiar with John Weir Perry. And... Mm, you know, yeah. no. I think I could I could afford to be more familiar with that renewal through the center. Yeah, I'm not sure. If I, I don't think I really understand that concept well enough to be able to give you a good answer. Um, yeah, there's so much learning to do. You know, there's so many areas to explore and learn, and uh, there's some areas that I just really feel like I'm barely even scratching the surface. Yeah, I'm down for a week long gathering. Yeah. I like that. Carl says, "Talk about mm. synchronicity." Uh, Synchronicity, yes, uh, synchronicity. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, you know, where to start? I mean, I, you know, I, well, you know, we were talking about singing out loud, you know, going over the edge of singing out loud. The other day I, I visited a nursing home you know, to talk about giving a talk there. And on my way, as I was driving, I started singing Tony Bennett, which I usually don't sing Tony Bennett, but it's kind of in my mind. And then when I get there, they're singing karaoke. And there's a guy singing Tony Bennett. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's so weird. I was just thinking about him, you know? And then there comes a time where someone starts singing a song, um, I'll Never Fall in Love Again. And right as they start singing it, I start thinking about Dionne Warwick. And I start thinking about a song that she sang. And then I realize, wait, that song that they're singing is by Dionne Warwick, but I had no idea. 
So why, what's going on with these coincidences of me like thinking things that are related to what's happening, but I didn't have any like visual input to let me know. So that was a day of really strange coincidences. There were a lot of synchronicities happening. Um, you know, my relationship with numbers is, is really amazing uh, of like, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, like in a kind of a sweat and then thinking, oh, I wonder what time it is. And then, you know, taking out the phone and seeing that it's not only 222, but the battery is at 22%. So it's 22222. That's the kind of life I live where numbers like dance in front of me and kind of flirt with me. I'll see 333 and then it'll change to 334 the moment I see it. It's kind of like it's like flirting with me and then disappearing. So I do have a lot of synchronicity in my life of just amazing coincidences. And I'm really left with a lot of curiosity around what that means. <laughs> I really don't know. You know, what does that mean? I, right now I'm taking it as it, maybe it means that my life is on point, like that I'm doing the work that, that is, is the right work for me to be doing. That's certainly how it feels today. Uh, there was a long time where I didn't sense purpose in this experience, but as I've gotten more on purpose, I get more and more synchronicity in my life, but I don't know. I, I, you know, sometimes when I get the numbers, I'll read online. I'll say, what does it mean when you see 1234, 1234, you know, and then people come up with these explanations that they believe that they know what that means. And there's some part of me that feels really skeptical uh, as to, you know, really understanding exactly what the mean, what it means. But the coincidences and the timing in my life are too much to ignore. But as far as what does it mean, I really... I don't know. Do you have answers? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Playing with me. Right. No, I do. I feel like I'm being flirted with and kind of teased a little bit. You know, the bells also have a very um, trickster kind of uh, relationship. They will sometimes chime in and answer questions that I really don't need to know. And then if I ask important questions, they don't chime in at all. <laughs> so they sort of have their own character. Um, yeah, I love synchronicity, and I'm still left with a lot of curiosity as to what it's all about. So here's a question um, regarding humans asking regarding feedback on tormenting voices they discussed and shame him. My son does not want to talk about them. How could I help him? He doesn't want to talk about them. Okay, so back to our channels. Okay, he's not expressing his auditory channel in expressing his awareness of the voice. That's what I hear when you say he doesn't want to talk about them. So then I think I wonder if there's any other channels there. I wonder, like, could he ever draw them? Or could he um, speak to how they move? Or speak to maybe like the feeling that he gets in his body? Or can we move on to those other channels? Is there a way that he might be able to express his awareness in a channel other than speaking? And you know, if he really doesn't want to talk about it, maybe he's in that, that second phase of don't go there, you know, and, and that's worth pacing as well. I don't want to, I don't want to push someone into expressing something if that's not where they are. Um, and at the same time, a lot of us say that we don't want to talk, but maybe part of us really does. And there's maybe kind of a mixed signal in there of, I don't want to talk. And then maybe something does actually want to share. But I really like those channels because, yeah, maybe somebody that wasn't, doesn't want to talk and maybe they're, you know, their hands tapping or maybe their foot's shaking or maybe they sometimes make some kind of a movement. I'm going to track into that movement and I'm going to do that movement with them. I'm going to notice it. I might want to try to make it a little bigger because I think that in the movement is probably the same energy that would come out as if he were speaking. And if the verbal, that kind of auditory channel is closed at the moment, then whatever that is that was going to come through in his words, it's going to come through in another one of those channels. I just need to be quick with my remote and be able to tune into which, which channel is the process currently flowing in. I don't believe that the process just stops, maybe when we die. Um, but I, I believe that when we, are, uh, when we are alive, the process is trying to communicate itself, even if it's not through our words. It's, you know, sometimes I compare process work to being like a safe cracker. Remember people who used to crack safes? Sometimes they would sand their fingerprints to make their fingers like really, really sensitive and you could kind of feel the, the mechanism inside the safe. Sometimes I think that in process work, that's what I've been doing to myself is I've been sanding my fingerprints to become more signal aware. Okay, so I'm like more sensitive when I, when I watch people speak, I'm watching their feet as well as their head. And my eyes are like moving up and down their whole body to watch for the signals because 
maybe there's going to be a signal that's going to come from somewhere else. And I want to be sitting there with my fishing pot, my fishing uh, reel and getting ready to reel that into the boat the moment I see it. So I'm not totally attached to what comes out of people's mouths. Another thing too is that I'm not, like when people do speak, I'm not really attached to the words. That's content. I'm really more attached to the energy. So energy over content and all the channels over just the ones that come out of our, of our mouths. Sometimes I think the universe is just playing with me. It's a play sometimes. <laughs> mm. Jen made a comment regarding synchronicity. She says, when I was in my altered states, I was staying with my mom, and she began having synchronicities, even though I never told her about mine. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Oh, isn't that great? That's so cool. I really like that, because it's like, yes, is there some kind of an experience that's like mutually co-arising two different people? It's both happening at the same time, even though there isn't communication happening between those people. I love that. It's so interesting. It makes me think of, um, you know, the concept called process mind, which is, it's almost like another word for God. It's like, you know, the, the, the grand process, the big process that's trying to express itself through us. Uh, that's it just, yeah, really makes me think like fascinating that there could be kind of a parallel process happening between two connected people when they're not really communicating directly with each other. It just speaks to how connected we all are. It speaks to living in a virtual reality is what it speaks to in my mind. Great. It's beautiful. So we have a question about, could you talk some about how dreams are useful in process work? Mm -hmm. Dreams are central in process work um, because dreams are that, that they're that place in yourself where the normal primary process moves out of the way. Okay. So the normal part of yourself moves out of the way. Now that whole other emerging part of the mountain can come forward and can come in. So dreams really do stand for uh, sort of unfinished experiences or incomplete experiences, things that are wanting to happen, but we won't allow them to happen. Uh, our dreams are really like a gateway into those experiences that, that can happen when our resistance isn't up. So that's a huge piece of, of dreams. The other piece that's really big is a concept called the dream body. And this is something that Arnie Mandel came up with in the 70s. And what he did is he noticed that there was a relationship between the content, actually it was the relationship between the energy in people's dreams and the things that happen in their bodies during the day. Okay, so, um, you know, imagine if someone has, uh, you know, like a, a sharp stabbing pain, you know, in their, in their daily life. And uh, maybe in their dreams, they're also having some kind of a stabbing uh, energy happen in dreams. So that would be that there's like an energy that's expressing itself in the dream when they're asleep. And then when they become awake, they're in the awake world, that that energy is now expressing itself not in their dreams, but through their bodies. And that the symptoms that show up in our bodies are sometimes related to consensus reality. And that's the first thing to check out. If you're experiencing something in your body, is it related to consensus reality? But if consensus reality doesn't check out, then maybe that's like a dream body experience. That's an experience that's tied to the energy of your dreams. And some people, you know, they you work on their dreams and their body experience changes. And some people, if you work on their body experience, then they notice it in their dreams. So it's very interesting. Uh, again, back to the virtual interpretation of reality. Uh, dreams are a virtual reality. That's like you're, it's a reality that feels real, even though it's not materially being kind of drawn for you at the time. And uh, the idea there would be that maybe the dream reality is the same thing as our waking reality that those are both actually virtual reality experiences. I could get really deep into that. It's a, it's a big thing to uh, to open up in such a short period of time, but it's good stuff. Sure. And to open something up, what, what, open another thing up, what are your thoughts about the existence of a collective unconscious? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I think in process, in process work, that might be called like the process mind. Yeah, which is... Uh, you know, some kind of a consciousness that's like bigger than any of us as individuals and that there's something that we're all sharing and connected. Well, of course we're all connected. If we live in a virtual reality, then this is really more of kind of a dream type of experience and that the distance between us is really only kind of, um, it's sort of an illusion, 
Um, so yeah, the, the collective unconscious to me feels like the kind of the bigger process that's trying to almost use us to make itself known. I, I really like that idea. Yeah, you know, a quarter of process work is Jungian psychology. So a lot of Jung's ideas are very much present in process work, even if they've been, uh, maybe the language has been changed a little bit. Um, Arnold Mendel was a Jungian analyst in Switzerland uh, before he uh, really took Jungian, Jungian work and actually kind of moved it and evolved it, which actually uh, that created some controversy in the Jungian community. And that's really what developed, that led to the development of process work as an independent branch of psychology. And thank you, Jen, for a great question. Mm, okay, so yeah, when people are concerned for loved ones, uh, yeah, you have a comment on attending to their awareness of themselves and not focusing only on the person experiencing extreme state. I really like that. What a great, what a great uh, question. You know, because to me that um, that speaks to the idea that we're really not separate from one another, and that uh, maybe we are connected to one another. And maybe maybe when when some of us go through extreme states, it's because we're actually holding the energy that those around us won't pick up, like the hot potato. So if that's the case, you remember I've said that, you know, extreme states don't really belong to us as experiencers. They belong to everyone. And maybe they've landed on us as experiencers, but that energy is actually something, it's kind of property of the whole group, the whole community. Um, so yeah, the idea of working with loved ones, that's great because I, I think that, you know, the, the phrase non-locality comes to mind. Maybe we can have like a non-local influence on a person having an extreme state by working with a member of their family because remember there seem to be these kind of invisible strings between people and you know if there's someone in the family who maybe won't pick up their own sense of madness then it's like the hot potato it's now landed on their loved one well then that makes me think i wonder if we could maybe explore your madness a little bit more and you know let's go wild let's let's go have Beatlemania together you know what i mean like let's find some way to kind of let that out of control quality come in because I believe uh, that when one person can pick up their madness more, that the person in their family who's having an extreme state will experience a lightning. They will experience a, a relief because that energy has now been picked up by someone near them. So yeah, to me, working with someone around the person in an extreme state is great. In fact, you know, focusing solely on the person who's having the extreme state, well, that's that's kind of the mental health system, isn't it? That's like you know, you're ill, you're sick, you're the center of attention, you're the one with the symptoms, but extreme states don't belong to the individual who's having them. So working on that community, working more than just loved ones, maybe working on the grand community, sounds great, sounds really good. And maybe it would be a little less, uh, you know, I feel less ganged up on if I were, if I were in, in my shoes having an extreme state and then uh, it was acknowledged that maybe <clears throat> some of the people in my family or in my community maybe you know need a little work themselves. <laughs> I'd find that relieving myself. Just be, people being willing to own that, yeah, I've had weird experiences or different experiences, and I don't even know how they all fit in and talking about that. I mean, that's something in peer support that people do, but I think a lot of more like, you know, I practice CBT for psychosis, but there's this understanding that the, the therapist being willing to share their extreme states and talk about that really humanizes it and says, yeah, this is something, you know, we have states and wait, how do we make sense of this, you know, <laughs> and these questions and, 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 it, and it just really helps people settle down and instead of thinking it's all about them, they start realizing it's more like you say, it's part of the our condition, our human condition. We have, you know, this, there's the whole ice cream cone, as you put it. Yeah, so Bert is saying, I noticed you're using your full awareness of yourself as well as tuning into the other. Perhaps when people are concerned for loved ones, you have a comment on attending to their awareness of themselves and not focusing only on the person experiencing extreme states. 
Right, right. You know, I work with a family uh, in open dialogue. I, I'm on an open dialogue team, and uh, we work with a family where everyone has had an extreme state. They, everyone has extreme state history. Okay, so it's not there. There isn't that isolation or that sense that like, oh, you're the mad one. You know, I would never happen to me. Instead, they all can acknowledge that, yeah, like the, there's a potato around, and we've all held the potato at some point. It really, really, like lends so much beauty into their interactions because there's there's not that just abject marginalization of that energy, and that all of them can actually acknowledge there's something that is special there, uh, incredible. See, working in Jamie says, I'm working in memory care. I would enter into the world of the person I cared for, and this seemed to make the other caregivers angry to the point I lost my job. I noticed that people are so afraid of letting people have their experiences that people think someone thinking they are at the YMCA and not a nursing home is dangerous and needs to be fixed. Do you think there is hope for that to change? Well, I do think there's hope for that to change and the, the you know, by virtue of the fact that you're around, you know, that you're out there and that you did this, that gives me hope. Uh, it gives me hope that I have a similar attitude, and I know a lot of people who have similar attitudes. You know, it even gives me hope that you got fired, <laughs> that you lost your job, because that maybe it means that you were doing your job right. You know, I, I there's a phrase, uh, you know, how do you know when you're flying over the target? Because uh, that's where the flak is the heaviest. And so you were like flying right over the target. You were doing something so important, and then yeah, they started trying to shoot you down for that. Uh, you know. Yeah, how could thinking that you're at the YMCA and not a nursing home be bad to me? I, I just, I don't have a problem with that. You know, when my grandfather was growing old, he uh, actually was kind of losing his memory, I should say. That when he was losing his memory, he started to think that he was in a hotel. You know, and, and there were lots of aspects of this hotel that were completely different from his consensus reality experience, but it's okay. It didn't seem to bring him to stress. You know, if, if somebody believed that they are the YMCA and not a nursing home and that that belief of being at the YMCA was causing them a great deal of distress, well, then maybe then I might consider trying to kind of nudge them into a belief that's maybe less distressing. But it has little to do with whether it's factually true and more to do with how it makes them feel to experience that, in my mind. But, you know, again, I'm not hold, having to hold down a nursing home. There's probably lots of practical considerations. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people are in situations where it is dangerous for them to be in the dreamy side of reality and they do need to wake up. Like you're driving down a car. I actually know people that have driven down a car and they started like hallucinating other cars or, mm -hmm. or thinking mm -hmm. that other cars were hallucinations when they real, which obviously led to traffic accidents. Right. We have an ice cream cone problem there. Consensus reality is, is always going to be here. And so driving a car and having these really dreamy or essence level experiences, unless you can hold down consensus reality at the same time, yeah, we got a problem. You know, consensus reality doesn't like to be marginalized. <laughs> and uh, plenty of us get hurt for pretending that consensus reality isn't real. But uh, getting stuck in consensus reality is also has its, its own set of dangers. I really like that idea of straddling, you know, can you straddle the different modes of reality at the same time? You know, uh, this feels a little edgy to say, but when I was going into an altered state, I was still driving my car. And I remember driving my car and noticing that I could like fall into kind of trance kind of experiences and drive my car at the same time. So I'm in both places. But as the state got bigger, I wound up just voluntarily setting my keys down. And because I realized, I understand the risk of things going wrong, which sometimes people didn't seem to appreciate that I had a sense of risk. And I remember noticing, like, I am so consumed by this now that I don't think I should be driving a car. Well, in a way, that shows that I did have some meta position, right? I did have some of that meta communicator that was able to look down and go, mm, too altered, you know? But there was a period of time where I was altered and living in consensus reality at the same time. And I mean, isn't that what daydreaming is? Like if you drive and you sing with the radio, like there's some party that's not really in CR anymore. They're not in consensus reality, but you're still driving. That's an example of straddling the levels. How about this question? What do you think? What do you think it is about music that can so easily trigger positive essence experiences? Is that something knowable? Is the ability for it to trigger oneness uh, why music is so universal? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. I, I definitely, in my experience, music was key. Like I remember 
you know, kind of getting high. And then I heard this one piece of music and it just went, like the state took this big stair step jump and now I was much, much higher, talking twice as fast as I was before, all in response to these beautiful patterns that I was hearing. It was just amazing. So yeah, there's something about music that did speak to that essence part of me and it still does today. I don't know, does it speak that way for everybody? I'm not sure. I know some people who don't really have much of a relationship with music or they don't hear music playing in their mind. I feel kind of sorry for them. But that's definitely part of my personal experience, but I can't really say if that's other people's experience. But yeah, music, huge. Playing music, too. Remember when I would play music in an altered state, it, I, I think I was able to play it better, um, more sensitively. It was more beautiful. All right. This is all great. Maybe we're reaching a natural end here. I do, we've kind of gotten to the questions, and you, John, you really have great energy in getting through all that. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate. It. Okay, well, I'll, I'll I'll sign off on the, um, the the webinar, but I'll keep the chat open for a little bit if people have more things they want to chat about. We can do that. So thanks again. All right. Thanks, everybody.